Thank you everyone for coming. Uh, my name is Jose Farangwala. I'm a faculty at George Mason. Uh, for those of you know where, where those of you don't know where that is, uh, it's about 10 miles from DC. So it's about 10 to 15 miles from DC. So it's pretty close to DC. If you stop by in DC, you stop by George Mason. Uh, we did some good research there. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, my research interests are in applied data mining. So I think of myself as an applied data scientist and Applications that I primarily work on are bioinformatics, uh, educational data mining, and social networking. So you see there's a span of things that I do, but I think that there is a cross-application of these methods. So over the years, I've applied different methods to different problems, uh, you know, of course, adapting them to the application. And what I'm going to talk about today is an amalgamation of all those things, and, and we'll see how those things come together in different applications, different case studies, and, and some of the methods that we have developed over the years. And uh, today I'm presenting primarily the work of my graduate student Azad, who, as I said before, uh, he graduated in February. He moved over to Microsoft uh, in Seattle. Uh, he said he couldn't come here because he has some visa trouble. And as I said to you guys earlier too, uh, I, I think it's better, you know, if he's stuck here than than where he is. Um, so, and then there's another student, Anveshi, who graduated two years ago. So I'm going to present some of his work too. And both these students worked a lot on hierarchical classification. So, so we have a good sense of what the methods are, what the problems are, and what are some of the solutions that we have developed, what the other folks have done, and, and together there's some, there's some interesting research topics uh, that could even go beyond here. Um, so just as a preview, for those of you who are, who are uh, PhD students or master students looking to get a thesis, looking to, there's a lot of like, interesting caveats here. You could push the envelope in different directions. For those of you looking to apply these techniques to your own practical problems, there's a lot of interesting things here. And we also developed some software uh, that, that I'm going to introduce to introduce here, uh, and you could use that, or you could use somebody else's software I'm to describe those things too. Is that, is that okay from a, like, what the scope of the tutorial is and things like that? I, as I said earlier, I really like this to be an interactive session. Uh, I, I, I teach a three-hour class sometimes, and I, I speak only for one hour, right? So, the, so, so I let the students do most of the work. I do not expect you guys to do two hours of talking, but I do expect that you uh, show me some energy and love by asking me some questions at least, okay? So feel free to ask questions. We are here to learn and, and things like that. Yes? Can we turn down the lights? Can we turn down the lights? I think, I don't know if it might be a problem from the video perspective, because they might want to see my pretty face on the net, right? Uh, so, so that will become harder to see. But we can ask the video person when he comes, and, and he can help us with that question. All right. All right, so that's a good start. Um, I just want to give you an outline of how, of how, these, uh, how this uh, session is going to be broken up into. So first, I really want to motivate why hierarchical, what is hierarchical classification, if you are not familiar with this problem. Why is this important? In which, which context do we see this? And, and what are some of the challenges? What are some of the interesting, uh, I would say, data mining, machine learning challenges that come about uh, when you try to solve this hierarchical classification problem? And then I'll tell you a little bit about some of the methods that are used for solving them. And then I'll, I'll, I'll describe to you some of the state of the art. So I'll say, if today you have to do hierarchical classification, then these are some of the techniques that you should, you should consider. And, and one of them involves a very costly setup. It's very expensive to set up, and another one doesn't is not that expensive. So there's a there's a trade-off here, right? So we'll talk about those trade-off, and that's why I say that these methods are scalable and also can do large-scale uh, hierarchical classification. In part two, we'll talk about what happens when the hierarchy or the hierarchical uh, definitions that you have are not consistent with what what you assumed, right? So are there some uh, problems with the definition itself, and how do you rectify that? And if you could rectify that, how would you how do you go around doing that? So we'll talk a little bit about that, and then I'll talk about some other interesting, as I said, you know, this, is a, this is now looking more as a research student. Uh, if you're a research student looking to find new ideas, this is a great space because you said these are some of the problems that are out there today that you could get your own thesis on, right? And, 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 and I hope that's what this uh, tutorial spurs. Um, and then I, I'll sign off with some conclusion. So that's our, uh, that's our plan, plan of action. So did we figure out the light question? Oh, he's going to ask, okay. All right, so let me motivate by saying that you know, we are at data mining conference. We are at KDD, right? This is the premier flagship data science conference. There's data everywhere, large amounts of data. Uh, it keeps on growing in multiple forms, for example, image, text, video. 
and, and essentially it's in all fields. And as I, as I said, as an applied data scientist, I've seen this evolution in bioinformatics or biology. And now I'm like kind of transitioning to this educational data mining space. And even there, you see like more and more growth of this data everywhere. And, and what you see is that it, it's, it's in all fields, for example, in, in vision, in bioinformatics, in web directories. So no matter what your data form is, All right. That was exciting, right? <laughs> right. So, so I, I guess the room agrees with me that data mining is exciting and challenging and there's lots of data and things like that. So, um, so images in, in computer vision, uh, proteins or proteins in, in, the, in the way they're organized as sequences, as 3D structures, um, as networks in bioinformatics. And, and as web and, and web directories, like so, when we when you serve the web, all the documents that get archived, or all the text data that you have online from different repositories. And one thing that we, you will see is common is that many of these uh, fields will organize their data into taxonomies, into trees, right? Into trees or graphs, right? And the and the classical uh, mathematical difference between a tree and a graph is is that in a graph, a node can have multiple parents, right? So in a tree, a node will have only one, like one parent. But in, in a graph, a node can have multiple parents. So you can have some cycles in a graph. So a graph looks more like a network. But essentially, your data gets organized in these structures. And this is, why is this useful, right? So I, my, my, my experience working with, with, with microbiologists is they like to organize things in taxonomy. They believe everything is like a tree of life, right? They say, oh, you know, this species is related to this species by this much distance, right? So they want to organize everything in this taxonomy. In the end, it's useful because it helps us, helps us in searching these this items which are organized that way, helps us in, in browsing these things, helps us in categorizing these things, and really useful from, from just maintaining the large amounts of data. Right? So, so another way to think about this is imagine looking at uh, millions of documents right, over, the, over the net. It's much better to say that these documents are represented by some sort of a structure which has some hierarchical aspect. And a hierarchical structure essentially implies that there is some gen generality at the, at the root level. And as you go down, you have some specificity. So here's a classical example where we can say that, um, let's see, where we can say that biology, chemistry, and physics type documents are all within this general class of science. But the, you know, these three are, if there was a document within biology, then that you could differentiate between a document with, let's say, physics, right? So, so there will be some difference between the document from biology and physics. But you also know that documents about these things are much different, about, about, you know, much different than documents that talk about politics, or that much different than doc documents that talk about uh, history and things like that. So, so there is this hierarchical structure that is omnipresent across the different, uh, different ways that we organize that. So in one way, um, putting our data mining or machine learning hat, hat on here, we can say that anything that is out here is our input, and I, and I represent that by x, and anything out here um, that, that is in the hierarchy is the output that I care about. So one way of defining the hierarchical classification problem is to say that given an instance, I would like to figure out what its path in the tree is. Right? So what is its path in the tree? So can I figure, figure that out? Can I figure out that, uh, for example, this document belongs to football, and hence it belongs to sports, and hence it belongs to the class of all documents in this database? So formally, I want to say that given a hierarchy, hierarchy of classes, can we exploit or not exploit the hierarchical structure to learn models that will classify unknown uh, test uh, examples or instances to one or more in the hierarchy? Right? So if I was to define what's the objective of the hierarchical classification problem, then I would say the goal is if I give you an instance, if I give you a document, can it again tell me the path in the tree? Is that okay, folks? Now, if it was not a tree, uh, if it was a graph, then you could say, can you tell me the multiple paths in a graph? Okay. So this, this, you know, this uh, first level definition of hierarchical classification leads us to uh, think about what are some of the challenges here? What are the problems with this? What are the problems with this statement? And what are the variations of these problems? Right. So, so as researchers, we make we make a living by saying, you know, here is the scope. But now let me extend this in this way and say, can I solve this problem? And first of all, is it, is it, does it make sense from a real world perspective? So that's, my, uh, that's some of the perspective that I want to give you. So the two solutions 
that we can talk about how to solve the hierarchical classification problem is manual classification or automated classification. And the reason this word manual classification, which means no classification really, uh, stuck about is because I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, when I work in the protein structure space, right? So uh, bi structural biologists go take an X-ray of this protein structure, and then, then they look at it, they visualize it, and they say, based on this, you know, visualization, two biologists look at it, not just one, right? They look at it and they'll say, this structure looks like an alpha beta protein. So let me put it in this path of the hierarchy. So that's the manual classification process. Okay? So. Um, manual classification requires uh, essentially human understanding and expertise, and as obvious, it's invisible for the large amounts of data that we see. So essentially, a new example come in. Here is my, um, you know, here's my structural biologist. He's going to look at this protein structure, and then he's going to say, oh, you know what? This protein structure looks like this A.1, and hence it also belongs to the class A, and hence it belongs to R. He might also make this determination that it does not belong to A.1 and A.2, but it belongs to this class A, and it's so new, it's so, so different from anything that I've seen before, that I need to go create a new class, which, is, which, is, which I will go put, put out here. Right? Or I, I don't want to create a new class right now, let me just stick it up at A, and later on I'll create a new class, when I see some more examples in, the, uh, in, my, in my data sets that I'll see this. Okay? So I'm giving you some twist uh, of the classification problem. Automated classification problem is that uh, you have a trained expert such as computer, uh, you'll get an example, uh, the algorithm, which will be a classical data mining algorithm, will take that example and will uh, put it in this hierarchy. Okay? So let's talk about first, so we in this room could sit here and say, let's think of, let's brainstorm some solutions and all of us come up with some really great ideas here, right? And these ideas have evolved since 1997. So, so some of the you know, initial work was done in 1997. And over the years, people have like, expanded on those and found some of them not scalable, some of them scalable, and things like that. Okay? But so let's talk about some of these challenges. So the challenge number one is, um, is the example labeled, a single labeled, or is it multi-labeled? Can it have just one class definition, or can it have multiple class definitions? Right? If you were to classify tweets of a certain president, right, you could put it in multiple classes. You could say it's highly political, it's conservative, uh, you know, it's, it's related to healthcare, but it's also related to some random bogusness. Right? So, so given this, info, you know, this like 160 characters of a, of a tweet, you can like, have multiple labels assigned to that. Right? So if you could assign multiple labels uh, for a given example, then you have either a single path in the tree, or here, you could have multiple paths in the tree. Now, I'm not saying that this is classifying within a graph. I'm just saying that at the, at the leaf level, I have multiple paths that originate. Okay? So single versus multi-label. Mandatory leaf node versus internal, uh, internal node prediction implies that at, at one class of problems, I have to assign each example to the lowest level in the leaf. Right? So let's think about that for a minute. Right? So every example that I'm going to predict for has to be assigned a label that is at the leaf level. Okay? In the other case, I don't need to know that. Do, don't need to do that. I can assign examples to belong to the internal nodes, or I can also internal orphan nodes, which means I do not have a category for it at the lowest level of the tree. I haven't found enough examples for it, so I also call it orphan. It doesn't belong to any of the children nodes in, 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 the, in the downstream, so I call it like an orphan node uh, prediction. So I, I hope you see that you know, where these cases might arise. As we get new and new like, data, we might see that our hierarchy becomes insufficient to answer, uh, to, to, to define labels for certain examples. And if that happens, I would say that that's like the orphan node prediction. So as over time, you might say, I need to define new, uh, you know, new assignments which do not exist in my tree at all. So it's orphan, hence we call it the orphan node. So another issue might be that, can you first detect that it was an orphan node? So you try to classify something and say, oh, it doesn't exist in my database at all. I cannot assign this with high confidence. So can I assign it to something that doesn't exist in my, in my tree at all? Rare categories, right? So 80-20 uh, problem exists even here, which means that many classes have very few labeled examples, right? So most of the 
uh, if, you, if you have a tree structure, uh, which comes from a text data set, or even from a protein data set, or even from an ImageNet data set, what you'll see is that there are lots and lots of rare categories, which means that uh, the number of training examples that get assigned, that are, that are available for majority of the classes, are very, very few. And very few of the classes have lots and lots of examples. Right? So this is the 80-20 uh, power law type issue that we see here. And, and just, as a, you know, just, to, you know, just to make you believe that I'm not like, making up these things, right? so we, we did a study on this. And we said that what you'll see is that this is mo most prevalent in large scale data sets. So there is this data set called DMOS. Right? It's, a, it's, a, it's a data set that I'll refer to a lot. It's a data set. Uh, it's a text, a uh, hierarchical text data set. Um, I think some European organization ran a competition called large scale hierarchical text classification. It still does that. So it's a blind prediction competition. And the goal is given an example, uh, given a document, can you classify it in the hierarchy as, at, at one of the tasks that they, that they ask you to work on. And within there, what you'll see is here I'm doing a histogram plot of the number of examples per category. So what you see is that up to 70% of the examples in this red and, red and gray or red and black um, are with training examples which are less than or equal to 10. Right? So 30% of the classes have more than 10 examples. So there's this rare category problem or imbalance problem that you want to address when you try to solve these, those problems. This is an interesting one, which is feature selection. Uh, uh, you know, moves it, move, uh, show, shows up here too, which means that all features are not essential to discriminate between classes. Right? So what this means is that you, you, if you think about this, if you have lots of documents, and let's say you were classifying between animal science and sports. Right? In, your, in your mind, you know the words that get associated with these categories. So for example, in a science document, you usually see experiment, hypothesis, and theory. And as soon as you see that, you'll say that this document belongs to the science class. But if you were to distinguish between documents at the next level, the features are hopefully are the words that are relevant to those, those, uh, those classes should be different from the, uh, the higher level. And in that case, if you wanted to distinguish documents that belong to chemistry, um, you know, high school chemistry nightmares, which will be reaction chemicals and mixture, right? So you'll, 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 those words should, you know, resonate with you guys. You're a hard crowd to please, I must say. Like I'm trying my heart to like crack these jokes here and trying to make this as exciting as I can. But but that's what that you know that's what happens on day one of a class too. Um, so so reactions, chemicals, and mixture belong to the chemistry class, and that helps you distinguish between the physics and the, and the biology class. Okay. So feature selection is important. We might have come up with a scheme that allows you to do feature selection at multiple levels in a smart way uh, to really get uh, you know, benefit of the structure of the hierarchy and, and get much better results. Parameter optimization. So we'll talk a little bit more about this, because some of the, um, the state-of-the-art methods really uh, you know, hone on these things, right? So one of the things that they, they want to do is they want to incorporate uh, what are called relationships, parent and child relationships, and sibling relationships, right? So, so, you know, you have some similarities to your siblings, right? But you also want to differentiate yourself from your, uh, from your little brother or little sister or big brother or big sister, right? So you, you have this uh, sibling rivalry or sibling rivalry that is going on. So there are some parameter optimization that can help uh, improve these, these problems. And, and if you don't follow this right now, hold on to this, because we'll come back to this. Okay? So we'll, uh, we'll talk about this. Scalability is another, another issue. Right? So right now, I'm not talking about this new uh, class of problems, which are called extreme classifications. So we'll talk about those too. But even in this old, I would say like old because it's 2012, these old benchmarks, right? scalability is a big issue because, for example, if these were the number of training examples, and these were the number of leaf nodes, and if these were your number of features, then if you assumed that you build a model, if you build a classification model per class, and if you just multiplied uh, the class number of classes with the number of features, what you'll find is these are the total number of parameters that you have. So some of the old, some of the models, you know, these are the number of parameters that you need to learn. And hence, the size of your model goes to like 18.5 gigabytes for these older data sets. Right? So this is a big memory issue here. Right? So I'm going to talk about that a little bit, how to optimize that. And, 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 and what you'll see is that uh, this new class of problems, which are called extreme classification, 
the number of classes, right, are not in the range of 12,000 or so. The number of classes are in the range of millions, right? And a classical uh, scenario where this shows up is, given a tweet, can you uh, classify this into mi the millions of classes that are available, millions of hashtags that are available automatically, right? And so, so you're, uh, there is a real explosion if you, if you, were, you, you go to use the entire feature space and build a model per, per hashtag, which you probably are not going to do, then the, the model size is going to go even, even, even larger. There are some issues related to if you were training 12,000 um, classification models, which could be either SVM based or logistic regression based, the training time that it takes to build per, uh, uh, per model, and how do you deal with that? How do you do distributed? Um, and I'm a big believer in doing distributed computation, uh, but I'm also big, I'm also lazy, so I want to do embarrassingly parallel uh, distributed uh, computation. So I want to avoid any sort of uh, concurrency issues that might arise because that slows up your computation and also involves ex expensive setups then, like Hadoop or MPI or something that, that involves a little bit longer. Okay, so I'll show you some examples where you're going to use Hadoop to do that, and then also show you some examples of where you do not use Hadoop to, to do the same thing. Consistent hierarchy, uh, and we'll touch upon this in part two. So they'll say that this is a, when your, your hierarchical definition is incorrect altogether or is inconsistent uh, in the way it's formed, or it has changed over time to become inconsistent. Right? So the hierarchy has changed. Uh, we have new science now, so the taxonomy that we are seeing in, in uh, the tree of life has changed. There was a species that we completely ignored or we put it in the wrong side, uh, wrong branch of the tree, so now we've got to fix that up. So any, this is a good place to ask some questions, right? So, so any like quick questions on, are the challenges coming out clear? Are there some challenges that you think I'm missing altogether, which I might be? And uh, is the problem of hierarchical classification clear to you? Yes. Okay. Right. 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 So the, the question is, uh, you know, you have lots of text data and, and you have some structure there. Is hierarchy similar to structure? So at some levels it is, right? So there are some relationships to knowledge graphs and things like that or semantic graphs if you have that. Um, the, the, the assumption that I'm making is that I already have a well-known structure or I have a poorly defined structure in the next part, and my goal is to give it a new document, classify them into that structure, right? So, so, so to, to, ask you, to ask you a follow up, if, if you get a new document for your, whatever this purpose is, right, uh, what's your process and what do you do to assign it to that structured database? Is it manual? Uh, is it automated? Uh, is there a process? Okay. Okay, it's going to start. So, so uh, I could suggest some processes. One process is ignore the complete structure and build a classification model that, that just assigns the example to the closest node in the it, closest node that exists in the database, right? Build a k-nearest neighbor classifier that says these this document is similar to this five other documents, and this was the label, or this was this is how it's most closest. Okay. But we. So unsupervised implies that you don't have an expert, right, who has defined a structure for you, right? And, and you could do clustering, right, as, as you're starting, as, 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 your, as your structure, but that's not the scope of this tutorial, it means you could certainly do that. And the, the question then for you is, uh, which clustering algorithm makes sense there, and how would you assign some validity to your clustering solution or unsupervised solution that you have, right? So you'll have to spend some man hours, some labor at least, uh, to, to, to get the structure defined to say that this is what the labels of that, uh, of that unsupervised hierarchy looks like. And then what I would recommend is if, if this is open source data, please share this with the world. Okay? All right. Sorry. Go ahead. Right. Right. Yeah, so this will assume these are all discrete labels or leaflets. There's no ordinal relationship between those labels. But we don't talk about that, but if you connect with me after the talk, we have some papers on how to assume that the hierarchy is an ordinal nature, and we, solve some, some, we have some methods that solve that. 
but you but but I think we'll we'll have to talk about that. So maybe uh, at the end, if you know, if we have one hour left, we can talk about that. Okay. Somebody else, you had a question too. Right. So, so what I'll say is, this is a tutorial where I uh, present lots of other people's work too. Right. So there are certainly other folks who have worked on these multi-label, uh, leaf-level decisions, which are soft. Which they'll say that I'm 30% in this path and 60% in this path. My whole issue with any of these things is how do you evaluate those things at the end? Right. It's hard to evaluate something as 30%. Right. Uh, you're 30% in love with someone. That's hard to evaluate. Right. Uh, so things like that. Other questions. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and, and, and now give you a, like a little bit overview on what are some of the easier, like what are the, some of the, you know, if you were solving this problem today, what would you do, right? And, and I'm assuming you also could do the advanced things, but I'm saying that this is like a good start to help us talk about the advanced topics. So there's some notation here, and, and the notation is it's just a, it's just a way to uh, talk about some of these things again and again. So as I said, our input will be X's. Right? So anything that is an input will be x. And in any classical machine learning, the goal is to go from x to y. So I'm going to learn some sort of a mapping function that takes this x and learns a y. Right? And I'll talk about what that y is. And w will represent uh, that, that mapping. Right? So if you assume some linear relationship, then you say x times w gives you y. Okay? So the way this is organized is that I have, let's say, n number of training examples. So n is the total number of training examples that exist in my data set. So those are along the rows of this large matrix X. And D are the total number of features, right? So they are along the columns of that matrix. So, so essentially, this is my uh, input space. And Y is essentially my class relationship, right? So if you notice, the Y looks like a multi-label type definition. So for this example, I have a label here. And I have a label here, which means, you know, based on some hierarchical definition, as you trace down the path of the tree, you will assign whatever, whichever node you belong to will have a will have a will have a label one associated in that in that column. Okay? And then W is essentially the feature space, right? We'll assume that in this in these models, we'll assume that for each class in the hierarchy, I train, let's say, a linear classification model. Okay, so for each node in the hierarchy. I train a linear classification, which means, um, so in this case, I'm only going to represent the L leaf nodes, right? The leaf nodes that exist. So for each leaf node, I have a class, of, I have a linear uh, classification model, which means I have d weights that I need to learn per classification model. Okay? So I represent that here by this weight matrix. That I need to learn. Okay? I can also say that uh, let me represent all the all the non-leaf nodes too, and that also you could represent very easily, but just not to confuse you, I'm just going to show the leaf nodes. Okay? Now, my, um, okay, so this is uh, x, this is y, and this is the weight. So I want to get a good sense that this comes across a little bit clearly first here, right? So the most important one is here, right? These are standard in any, um, any of the other machine learning tasks that you do. This is a little bit different in the sense that this y is defined based on the structure or based on the hierarchy, right? So again, I want to repeat, oh, sorry. It jumps. So this y is defined based on the hierarchy of the structure, which means for this first example, it maybe belong to, let's say, node A, and it belongs to some other node within the tree, and maybe it belongs to some other node also within the tree. And for this guy, also belong to the same you know, parent child, but didn't belong to the same, uh, didn't belong to the same child, child node because it has a diff it has a zero out there. And our goal is to essentially, given a new example, figure out what its y star is, or figure out what its prediction. Is. Assume, and hopefully that prediction is as close to the ground truth as possible. Okay. Is that okay, folks? Questions, thoughts? No. Okay. So let's move on. And as I said, a classical any sort of like. Class, you know, classification problem that you see, you essentially have some training data, and training data will have you know x's, which are x1, x2, let's say n training examples, and for each of those you have some labels and y, and your goal is to do learn some 
mathematical function f of x, so that in the future, when you get uh, an example x which you, whose label you don't know, you want to predict, you will apply f of x and you'll assume that this prediction y hat is the ground truth. And maybe you, you have some money, so you'll go do some manual ex, uh, you know, annotation and you'll say that, um, oh, you know, this algorithm is as correct as, as my experts, human experts. Okay? So, any sort of learning algorithm has this general form formulation. So please let me know if you, if, if this is, um, so I'm assuming some of this is background knowledge, so if you don't follow this, please ask me questions here. Um, so I'm assuming there are two things here in these classical uh, machine learning algorithms, and the two things are the empirical loss, which controls how well the learned model fits the training data. Right? So essentially I have some training examples, I'm trying to learn a weight function or, or some weight vector, and I'm essentially optimizing this loss function. Right? So I'm minimizing this loss function with the parameters of W, and I'm using X, X and I'm using Y. So what I'm doing is I'm taking each example, I'm passing it through my current function, right? current weights, and I'm saying, hey, this is the Y hat. I know what the real value is, and I'm saying, what is the difference? So that gives me some loss function. And then there is this another term, which is called the regularization term, which will prevent the model from hopefully overfitting. Right? So who in the room is familiar with overfitting? Half of you, okay. Uh, so overfitting is, uh, you know, the best way I, 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 I like to describe this is to say that you train the model on your data set, right? And you re retested your model on the same data set, okay? And you get 100% accuracy and you feel very happy about that, right? So at that point you say you don't understand overfitting, okay? Because the model clearly overfitted, right? So the best way to explain overfitting is you assume that the model that you learn will generalize or will work well for future unseen data whose ground truth you, don't, you, you possibly don't have right now, don't have access to, okay? So essentially you train a model and given, you essentially want to test it on future examples and you want to deploy it and you want to see how much loss or profit you make and based on that you will decide if the model overfitted or not. Right? So that's one way of thinking about this. Another way, classical way is to say that Look, look, I cannot take these risks with my customers because if they get upset, then I, then I lose business, right? So instead of that, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna somehow have a held out set, right? And this held out set is gonna be really independent of any of the tuning, any of the things that I do in my training phase. I'll never see this in my training phase. Once I'm confident that this model works very well, I will test it on this. And if that test, right, is, is very good, if, if my scores are very good, then I'll say, oh, you know, hopefully it's not overfitted. Okay, and the reason I say hopefully is because maybe the distribution changes later on for your unseen test example. But this is the approximation that you might probably be doing. Okay, so this term out here essentially helps us in preventing a model from overfitting to only the training example. So it assumes that you know whatever things that you're learning just doesn't tune itself to the training example. It gives you some push in the other direction says, oh, you know, you can take a little bit error, but at the same time, you can get a bit, little bit better models. A good test for overfitting is you have a training error and you have a test error, your held out test error, right? So, so classical way to think about this is if your training error is very low, but your held out test error is high, probably overfitting. If your training error sucks, if the training error is very high, and your test out error is also high, underfitting, because you probably didn't do anything smart here. So something, there's some issues here, you could improve your model. So there are these trade-offs that you, that you want to learn. Yeah, but this is a, in any, uh, any uh, first step data mining class that you do, or machine learning class that you do, this is a, a concept that is well, well taught there, okay? So let's think about what are the different approaches for solving hierarchical classification problem. And as I told you, this problem has been around for, for years, right? So the, there are some, there's some work done in 1997, and, and 2007, 2013, and, and things like that. So the easiest one is, you know, ignore everything that we talk about in this tutorial, right? Just ignore everything. The brain death approach, right? Which is ignore the hierarchy altogether, train a classification model for each of your leaf nodes. Okay, so we don't care about the, all the structure business, right? I have 100,000 leaf nodes. I'm gonna train 100,000 classification models. And each classification model is supposed to answer one question. Given a new example, do you belong to this class? Or you do not belong to this class, 
So one versus rest or one versus, you know, one versus others, okay? And a new example comes in, and it'll ask this question to each of those leaf nodes, and they'll say, okay, max, whoever gives me the max prediction score, that's the, exam that's the class that I belong to, right? So it ignores the hierarchy, ignores everything, and that's essentially my flat classification pattern, okay? And in practice, it works really well, actually, right? So in practice, it works well. It has some issues. So one of the classical issues that you could think about is that, uh, so let me, ask the, let me throw this to the audience, right? So besides the structure, right, besides ignoring the structure, what other issues do you think it has? Class tensor, you mean like uh, imbalance problem? Like You mean like more examples are focused on some classes, so you're probably doing well on some classes? If you have a class, right. Uh, class. right. That's a great, that's, a, that's very important, right? So essentially when you ignore the structure, what is gonna happen is your performance is gonna be tuned towards the larger classes. Right? The, you'll do very well for the larger classes, of course. Classes which have more examples. Classes that are sparse, right, or are, are rare, you will not be able to do very well. Okay, so my, uh, I, I hope to convince you that by using the hierarchy, you will do well for the rare class if you care about the rare class, right? So if you don't care about the rare class, then I'll say don't care, you know, don't ignore it, don't care about it. Okay, so that's one thing. What else? Scalability, so why, why scalability? Right, so scalability is an issue. At the sense that, remember, I, for a reason I said you have 100,000 leaf nodes, right? So prediction time, you have an online model, it's gonna make a shopping decision for someone, it's gonna figure out which you know, sh bucket this example goes in. It's gonna fire 100,000 class models. It's gonna ask 100,000 class models. Do I belong to this class or do not belong to this class? Do I belong to this class or do not belong to this class? And of course you could do this in an embarrassingly parallel way. You could do this in a distributed way. But um, it's still expensive. The, the computation is expensive. So there's some scalability issues, okay? So we'll try to argue that the structure or the hierarchy will help you here. Uh, and when it doesn't help, we'll, we'll, we'll say that the hierarchy is poor, so let's improve that and still, uh, still go on, okay? Um, so the classical one is just ignore the hierarchy. The other one say utilize the hierarchical information. And there are two essentially threads. One, which are called local, they make some local, uh, uh, local. they essentially take into account the local relationships, um, you know, whose parent, what, whose parent and child it is, or something which is more global. I mean, they'll take the hierarchy, and they're essentially also called big bang approaches, because they're called big bang, because they take the hierarchy and put it in an optimization framework and use the hierarchy to come up with some decisions. So we'll talk about these, uh, some of these, some of these issues. So, this is the simplest method that I already talked about. It ignores the hierarchy. Again, I want to stress the way this is going to work is I'm going to ignore everything about the leaf node. I'm going to assume the, the standard problem, single label, hierarchical classification problem. Each example gets assigned to the leaf node. No orphan nodes, no, uh, no funny business right now. Okay? And I'm going to train a classification model for each of the leaf nodes. And given an unlabeled uh, uh, test example, I classify them using this rule, which is arg max of f of x, y, w. All it means is that each of the models fires up during prediction time and asks the question, who, who's the max? And hence, I belong to that specific class. Okay. Instead of that, I could do something called a local classification per node. Um, and the way this is going to work is I'm going to learn binary classifiers for all the non-root nodes. Right, so I'm going to learn a cl classifier for all the non-root nodes. So for, besides the root, I will learn a classifier uh, for all the non-root nodes. And now the goal is to effectively discriminate between the siblings. So this guy is responsible for distinguishing between A and B. These pair are dist uh, responsible for distinguishing between A.1 and A.2. And these guys are responsible for distinguishing between B.1 and B.2. So as I go down my hierarchy, they become more and more specific in what decision function they are taking. Okay. Now the, the, the key advantage of this is that during prediction time, right, during prediction time, a top-down approach has followed for classifying unlabeled examples, right? So this is a strength of the hierarchy where you will um, you know, make a decision at this level to say, do I go down this path or this path? And at this level, do I go down this path or this path? So at every level, I have now 
pruned how many models I need to fire, which means my prediction time is going to be much, much faster. Training time, in fact, is going to be larger than the flat classification model because I have to train a model for A and B also. Okay, so if you assume you are training the same kind of models, the, the training time is going to be much larger. Just similar to this is another one which is local classifier per parent node. So instead of assuming that you train a classifier per, so this is more like, uh, I, I would say nitty picky details here between the two uh, definitions, but the general theme is still the same. Okay? So in this case, instead of learning a one model per class, you're learning multi-class classifiers. Right? So now you can argue that multi-class classifiers are actually nothing more than uh, some binary, multiple binary one versus rest classifiers. So in a way they are similar, but I just wanted to show that there are some papers in the field that have tried to sh sh you know, show that this is, a, this is a theme. So they will learn multi-class classifiers for all the NEAF nodes, and just like the previous case, the goal is to effectively discriminate between siblings, and again, a top-down approach is followed here. Right? So when a, whenever a top-down approach is followed, your prediction time is gonna be super fast because you only go down the tree. You might make some errors, but, but you're going down the tree. There's another one which is called local classifier per level. Again, it's uh, similar uh, to these other two local approaches where you learn multi-class classifiers for all levels in the hierarchy. And this is the least popular among local approaches because there can be a prediction inconsistency that occurs, right? So the way this works is I have a level-wise classifier. So every, every level, I have a one versus rest classifier. So at this level, I can say during prediction time, do I belong to A or B? At this level, I, I, I'm not just doing the siblings, I'm saying, do I belong to A.1, A.2, B.1, or B.2? So during prediction time, I could have a decision which says you belong A, but then you belong to B.1. So then that is already inconsistencies, and so then there are some post-processing methods that will try to rectify these uh, inconsistencies in the decision that, that happens. <laughs> and then, the methods that, some of these uh, other methods, which is l w the global classification, and one of them is you learn a global function, there is this big uh, global function, you put everything in, a, in, a, in, a, in this magic function, and, and it will consider all these relationships, and given an unlabeled test instances, you're not essentially going down a tree or anything, you're just passing through this function that has this structural definition, and you're gonna come up with a uh, output at the end of this. And these are often referred as big bang approaches, Usually these are very expensive to compute, right? So they are very good to, um, they're very good for like 10 classes, 100 classes, but as soon as you get into the 10,000 and 20,000 and 30,000 range, you, you start falling into trouble here with just the scalability. Or, and then if that's the case, and if you really believe in these approaches, then you've got to figure out smarter ways of optimizing or smarter ways of doing distributed optimization for these things. in the objective function somehow. And we'll talk about this because these are very popular. And we'll see how they, choose, like they change the optimization function to make it efficient, otherwise it wouldn't work very well. Okay. Other questions? Okay. So just to recap, um, flat, ignore the hierarchy altogether, which means you know, whatever you learned in this four hours, just ignore that, which is fine, right? It's life is about decisions. Um, the optimization methods, and then there are global classification. So there are these class of approaches, and, and what we want to show is that uh, using hierarchy will help us, right, in multiple ways. It'll help us with the, with the poor guys, the classes which have less examples. It'll help us in some, uh, you know, improving the results in some manner, and help us in uh, better prediction time, or also it may help us in improving the training time in some cases, okay? Otherwise, the flat is pretty fast at training time, because it's flat, it can ignore everything, you have an embarrassingly parallel solution. So before I go on, I want to say, when we, whenever we uh, present some, something like this, you'll say, I want, we need to compare apples and oranges. I want to compare apples and apples, right? Or I want to co compare Honeycrisp apples and if Canada has any apples, Canadian apples, right? I'm from Minnesota, so I like Honeycrisp. So the question is, um, should misclassifications be treated equally, right? So one way to think about this is that if I was to evaluate Classification algorithms, there's a you know, accuracy, precision recall, if it's imbalance, F1 score, area under the rock curve, so I can do all these different metrics if I have a standard classification problem. In this case, uh, the hierarchy presents some interesting ideas or interesting challenges. So one of the things is that, let's say this is my true class and this is my predicted class in this case, 
And another method, the, you know, the true class remains the same, but the prediction is here. So should the, you know, should the case that in this method, right, I was at least able to predict its sibling correctly, give me some more brownie points than this method where I'm even missing the sibling altogether. For those of you are colorblind, I'm sorry, you're going to be lost here right now for this slide, okay? But, but if you bear with me, there's, uh, what I'm saying is that my true class is 8.1, and my predicted class is 8.2 in method one, and true class is 8.1, and the predicted class is B.1. Which do you think is a better method? Um, clearly the one on, the, on your left, right? Because at least in this case, I got the A class, you know, the, the A correct. So there are some methods uh, that will take, metrics that will take into account this hierarchy, and you know, again, there are lots of these measures, so we we should we we could we could look at that, right? So the common ones, uh, which are flat evaluation measures, don't take into account this. They just give equal. So one is micro F1 and macro F1. One of them gives equal weightage to all examples dominated by the common class, and macro F1 gives equal weightage to each class. In case of imbalanced problems, it's better used to use macro F1 than micro F1 because micro F1, you know, if you're if you're getting correct for the larger classes, then you get lots of brownie points. But in the macro F1, you have to get each of those classes correctly, equally, right? So there's, a, there's some distinction between these two for imbalance. And then to use the hierarchy, what we do is we use hierarchical F1, or we use something called a tree error. And as I said, there are other metrics that you could use, but these are the two common ones if you do hierarchical classification. One of them says that there's common ancestors between the true and uh, predicted classes. And the tree error is the average distance between the true error and the so one is an error metric and one is a score, right? Or one is a one is like an F1 score. <laughs> so 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 we'll use or, or so many of the methods that are out there will use these techniques uh, or use these metrics to do the evaluation. Okay. Now related to the concepts that I'm talking about, this some of these methods. Uh, Hierarchical classification can be thought of as a subclass. Some of the methods can be thought of as a subclass of this notion of multitask learning problems. So multitask learning is a pretty popular um, data mining technique. And the best way to describe it is, is that it involves, so first of all, in this room, I want to just get a sense of who's never heard of multitask learning, or who understands, or, uh, that's a, in the, who understands multitask learning very well has used this in his, his, his or her study, so it's a handful. Okay, so it'll be good to give you a, like a brief background on this, and, and we have some time for that. Uh, so single task learning versus multitask learning, right? So multitask learning involves uh, two key things. It involves the joint training of multiple related tasks to improve the generalization performance, which means to, to prevent overfitting, right? To, to work well in the future. Now, what does this notion of related tasks or multiple related tasks and joint training? So we'll, we'll talk about that. And independent learning problems can utilize the shared knowledge in this case. And usually these methods do, if you look at, you know, there could be a tutorial on MTL um, two, three years from KDD. In fact, in SIAM 2012, there was a very good tutorial on multitask learning and still I think holds. So if you're interested in that, you should look at that. Um, but if you look at the taxonomy of the methods, there are two, two key ideas. And one of them is that you exploit the biases that are helpful to all the related tasks by ensuring that similar set of parameters are shared or common features are shared, right? So there are these two uh, methods based on how you're, how you're doing this. And common examples, are, classical examples of personal email spam classification where many person with the same spam or automated, automated driving where the two tasks could be brakes and accelerators. So let me give you an example for some multitask learning where it's really popular and then, then uh, ask some questions here. So classically, right, let's assume that, um, you know, there is a province in, in uh, there's a province in Canada, and there are all these schools, right, and each of these schools have a standard set of data that they collect about their students, right? And based on the data that they collect about their students, the, the administrator of each of the school wants to figure out, uh, you know, which of these students are going to pass and which of these students are going to fail, okay? Um, so, so th this is a common, uh, so, so for each of the schools, the option number one is, uh, for each of these schools, they go hire a data scientist, right? And the data scientist will train the most basic linear classification model to do this, right? And they will learn uh, school number one, they will learn a classification model. School number two, 
you know, some other one will learn a classification model, like da 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 da. Okay. Now an another option is right is as I always like to think of the naive naive option is uh, you know the province says all your schools send me your data, right? So all the schools will send the uh, you know the state administrator or the province administrator all the data, and uh, the, the there's a data scientist hired there, and he will take all the data and he will just combine them and he'll learn one global model. This is not multitask learning yet. He just learns a global model, right? So option number one was local model. Everybody was learning a local model per school. Option number two was some, you know, everybody collected the data, they learned a global model. Okay, multitask learning is assuming that each of those schools, right, still maintain their own weight vectors, still maintain their model parameters, right? But there is some combination, there's some joint training of all those tasks, right? So if there were, let's say, 20 schools in this province, then there would be 20 independent models, but now they are being jointly trained, okay? With some assumptions, like right? so one assumption could be that, you know, we know that all the schools in this province um, have similar profiles, have similar characteristics, right? Which means that they share, all of them share a common feature space. So I can make this assumption in my uh, regularizer and I'll train a multitask learning model to do that. Now this is better than that global model, but we just said, oh, all these examples just go on to go to help you train train some class, class single classifier, and then you go apply to each of those, right? So what what the so what are the benefits and what are the pros and the cons here, right? So the benefits are, we assume that uh, you know since these provinces these schools are very spread out, the total number of students per school are not very much, right? They are only like 15 to 20 per school, right? So if you have 15 to 20 students per school, uh, you'll say, uh, am I good? Yeah. Okay. Keep on checking. Okay, so if you have 15 or 20 uh, students per school, it's hard to train a good classification model. But if I give you some, someone said, hey, I give you more data, then you'll say, oh, you know, more data will help me train a better model. So in some level, when you combine the power of many, you're getting that benefit, right? So, so multitask learning kind of says, if you combine all these tasks together, you're getting that benefit. By joint training, you're getting, getting to learn everything together. Assuming that they're related. Right? So I made that assumption that all the features in all these schools are related. What if they're not, right? What if this, you know, French-leaning schools versus non-French-leaning schools have some different characteristics? So maybe you want to set up some constraints that say for these schools, there are much more similar uh, models, and for these schools, there are not that much similar models, right? So you come up with these constraints. So multitask learning essentially involves those two things. You take those independent models and you jointly train them, which means you're taking all the training data available from all those different schools or different tasks here, and you are also exploiting anything that is shared, anything that is similar out there, okay? Um, and, and usually what you see is when you apply MTL in those cases, you will see a big performance boost. You'll see a big performance boost. So even like if you are at KDD, if you, you know, search for a multitask learning in that uh, app that we have here, you'll see like at least six or seven papers on that. Right? So it's a very popular uh, topic and it gives you very good results and, and, and improves uh, performance a lot. Now what I want to argue is that we will use MTL uh, for explaining some of these hierarchical classification methods and you'll see some similarities there. Okay. Any quick questions on MTL? And So this was like my, you know, fly over of MTL. As I said, it could be another tutorial that just talks about all the methods that are on MTL, and, and people have done that before. So I would really recommend this uh, tutorial on SIAM 2012. Uh, so if you look for that, you'll see that. Any questions, quick questions on this? Yes, no? Everybody okay with this concept? So ask me again when I, when I talk about this if this doesn't come clear in our context now. So this is one of the uh, 2013 uh, published uh, papers, and um, it essentially will exploit this parent-child relationships um, within the multitask learning uh, setting to solve the hierarchical classification problem. Okay, and this was done by Kopal and Yang. Uh, so again, the traditional approach will be to learn a classifier for each of the leaf node to discriminate one class from another. Right, so. I'm again going back to my ignore the hierarchy approach, right? So that's the classical one. And the way this looks is that for each of these guys, I'm minimizing, uh, you know, I'm minimizing this, this, this is my loss function, this is my regularizer, I'm minimizing this whole thing, and I'm learning this W of T 
where w of t is the weight vector for the leaf node. Is that okay? So w of t's dimensions are d, where d are the total number of dimensions, whatever this application might be. So, so, when, for, for, so, so essentially the way this is going to work is for these four nodes, I, I am going to have four weight vectors. And for each of them, I'm independently uh, you know, solving this optimization problem. Uh, if you haven't seen this before, this is nothing more than the SVM hinge loss. Okay, so this is nothing more than the SVM hitch loss. And if you don't like this, replace this with a logistic loss or a least square loss, and you'll get the same, uh, you know, benefit, uh, same uh, assumptions, right? Or same assumptions when you talk about the hierarchy. So this works well. Again, this works well if the data set is balanced, is small, and there are sufficient positive examples per class to learn a good discriminant function, right? If I give you two examples per class, you're not going to be learn, able to learn anything good. So, so this works well if the uh, data, total data set is small, there are sufficient positive examples per class, and, and it's balanced. The drawbacks are again, uh, let, so I'll have to take a, all right, good, okay. I didn't like that one, okay. So, it's, so the drawbacks are the real world data sets suffer from rare category issues, and again, remember that 70% of the classes have 10 examples per class. So again, I'm not making this up. This is you know, validated in the, in, the, in the data sets. And there are a large number of classes. And that's a scalability issue. Okay. So the goal was, can we improve the performance of the data sparse leaf nodes by taking advantage of the data rich, um, data -rich nodes at the higher level? So can we improve the performance of the data sparse nodes by improving uh, performance at the higher levels? So what they do is they incorporate these interclass dependencies to improve the classification performance. So for examples, uh, belonging to soccer are less likely to belong to the software category. Right? If a document is about soccer, it's going to talk about Ronaldo, right? It's not going to talk about Bill Gates, right? For example, or not like not talk about software, for example. So now what we're doing is for each of the leaf nodes, I've I've done two things, right? So there are two changes. If you look at the original function. Right? So this was minimizing the leaf node. Uh, there was a regularizer term, and there was a loss function. And this was i is equal to 1 to the number of examples that belong, uh, belong to that set. Right? Now what I'm doing is, there are, you see there is two changes. Right? One, there's some change here, and there is some change here. Okay? So first of all, there's a double summation, right? if you didn't notice that. And then there is some change here. And what I'm doing here is I'm saying that whatever I'm learning, weight vector, what I'm learning for this leaf node a.1, that weight vector should share something with the weight vector that I'm learning for my parent node. And I represent that parent node by pi of t. I say that you know, if t is the leaf node, then pi of t is the parent node. And I'm going to also say that I'm going to do the joint training, right? just like in multitask learning, where I'm optimizing everything for all the leaf nodes, for all the children nodes. C of t represents all the children nodes, right? So for all the children nodes, I'm, I'm essentially taking all the examples that belong here, and I'm doing this joint training here, okay? So the MTL uh, definitions are, each task is a classification model per leaf node. Similarity is enforced by the parent-child relationship. Okay? And, and, and that's pretty much uh, the crux of it, right? So the objective was how do we how to effectively incorporate the hierarchical relationships into the objective function to improve generalization performance, and we want to also make it scalable now for larger data sets. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Okay. Now, the proposed formulation looks something like this, right? Uh, the key idea is again, the weight vector that you learn for your leaf should be similar to your parent, and it enforces these model parameter weights to be similar to the parent in the regularizer. And there are two state-of-the-art methods, uh, hierarchically regularized SVM and hierarchically regularized logistic regression, global formulations. Right? So the way this you, you can represent this is there are two cases that you worry about. One is the leaf node and one is the internal node. In this definition, the, the objective is always to classify the examples into the leaf nodes, the standard definition. So you cannot classify something as an orphan and, and not, go, uh, not go all the way to the leaf node. So the way this works is now, for the leaf node, we already talked about this. You'll say, you know, there is this, this term for the leaf node which says, my weight is similar to my parent, 
and I have my loss function over the, all the examples that I'm seeing. Okay, but for the internal node, some somebody who's internal, my weight vector is similar to my parent, and is also similar to all the children that I have. Right. So this is the the same thing as this one. So this is the parent, and this is all the children nodes. Right. So now the weight vectors that you're learning will have this have these shared relationships. So in a way, if you think about this. What this is also doing is your brother and sister or your siblings look very similar to each other. Right? They will also start because the parent is similar. Right? So you're saying I'm similar to my parent and my, 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 I have a little brother. So my little brother is similar to my parent. Even though we, we both are not very similar, now we are being forced to be very similar. Okay? So that's what this model will enforce. Okay. Now the change here is this is as I said hinge loss. And if you don't like hinge loss, then you can replace hinge loss by logistic loss, and you get what is called HRLR, right? So in, their, in this 2013 paper, they showed both these formulations, there's optimization, um, solution, and everything in, the, in this formulation. So again, if you notice, for the internal node, there is no loss function and force only regularizers. And the leaf node, there is a specific loss function. In fact, you could potentially put a loss function for the internal node to nobody stopping you from doing that. But I think it makes it less efficient. Okay, so actually, I think they tried that in a precursor paper, and they show that it's less efficient. Than this. So their proposed parallel formulation says that if you look at the way they broke up their objective function, then each node is independent. Oops, sorry. Each node is independent of all other nodes except its neighbors. Right? And what are neighbors here? Parent and children. Which means the objective function can be considered what is called block separable. right? And the way they optimize this, so remember, one way to think about this, what's going on is you have these weight vectors that you're learning for each of these nodes in the hierarchy. right? And if you think about what you're doing is you're updating the parameters that are dependent on the other weight vectors in that system. right? So if anything, affects that, then you cannot separate them out. Right? So what they, what they claim is that, if you look at this, then you know, if I'm updating the blue nodes, at that time I cannot update the red nodes. But I can update the blue nodes, is that okay? And at the next step, I can update the red nodes, and at the same time, I, I, I cannot update the blue nodes. Right? So I have to stop an update of the blue nodes. But at that time, I can update all these red nodes, and I can update all these red nodes. So each node is considered independent of each other except its neighbor, and they essentially use this black block, parallel block coordinate descent, which will be used for optimization. And, and the way this works is fix the odd level parameters, optimize the even level, fix the even level, optimize the odd level, and you repeat until you get convergence. Yes? Right. So, 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 so you, that's a good observation. What you'll notice is whenever you're doing update for your leaf nodes, it's much more expensive than update for the internal nodes. The internal nodes is nothing more than an averaging. Right? It's just saying, I take my weight vectors for my children, take my weight vectors for my parent, and W of that feature is minus of feature from the parent and feature from the children. So it's a very quick update. This is just an addition. This one is a little bit more than an addition. Right? So this, of course, is going to be a lot more expensive than this one. Okay, so as I said, uh, the red nodes are the leaf. At that time, you cannot update these guys. Right? So the way this normal update will work is you'll have some random weights for each of those vectors, and then you'll iterate. Okay, so so you will update these guys. That will be an expensive step. Let's say it takes ten minutes. After that, this will take one second. Then we could go back to ten minutes. Go back to one second. Go back ten minutes. Okay. So the, they they do this. Uh, they also show an extension to, so we talk only about tree. So worry not, there is an extension to the graph issues also. So extend to the graph, but this involves finding a minimum graph coloring and repeated, repeatedly optimizing nodes with the same color in parallel during each iteration. So that's a, li a little bit harder than the tree problem because now it's just not level wise. So you need to first find the minimum graph coloring, which is NP hard. So there'll be some heuristics for that. Uh, and then you optimize the nodes with the same color in parallel during each iteration. Okay, so if you're interested in this, that is, as I said, the 2013 paper is, is, a, good, is a good reference for this. 
Let's look at some of the data sets. So this is the first time we're seeing some of these data sets. I'll spend a little bit of time on that, and we'll use these data sets again. So keep them in your cache, because we'll keep on using them. So there is Clef data set. There is this RCV1, IPC, uh, DMOS, SWiki, LWiki. So all these data sets uh, from DMOS are part of that LSHTC, or Large Scale Hierarchical Text Classification Challenge. So if, you if you're interested in this line of work, then you should participate in this competition, because then it really helps you evaluate in a fair and a consistent manner. Some of them are single label, some of them are multi label. Um, CLEF is what is called a die, a die atom or a, or a molecular uh, data set. And RCV1 is a, is a text data set, and IPC is a patent data set. So it's a patent text data set. When, you, when it's multi label, we want to know the average number of labels per instance, right? So DMOS 2011 is 1.03, which means it doesn't have that many multi labels, per example. Whereas this one, on an average, has three other labels, right? So, so there are uh, you know, variances of this multi label problem that, that you can bring about. In terms of comparison methods, they have flat baselines like SVM, support vector machine. So you ignore the hierarchy and train one versus rest SVM classification models, or you train a one versus rest regularized logistic regression model, LR. Then we have these other methods which we haven't talked about yet, but uh, we talked about them in, 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 our, in our intro, like in our you know, brief background. Some of them are the top down, they're local, and things like that. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. So top down SVM is what is called a Pachinko machine style SVM. And, and the way this works is essentially you have a SVM classifier learn for each of the nodes in your tree, and you just go top down making decisions during prediction to fire them. You say, oh, you know, at this level, I, I'm in this, this node, so I don't need to consider any other uh, nodes from this part of the subtree, and I go down and I shrink my subtree at every level. <laughs> then there is this hierarchical SVM, which is a large margin discriminative method with a path dependent discriminant function. So they take the, uh, you know, they take the hierarchical structure within the optimization. Then there is this hierarchical orthogonal transfer, which assumes that there, is, there should be orthogonality between the parent and children. So this is not saying similarity. This is saying the weight vectors should be orthogonal between the parent and the children. Right? So they made this assumption. Um, and there's also this Bayesian logistic regression version, uh, which is a Bayesian method to model the hierarchical dependencies among class labels using a logistic regression. This, was the, this is the same authors as the KDD paper. So, um, HRSVM and HRLR are, um, I mean, since they will, of course, be better than HBLR, right? But this is just to show that even the Bayesian methods were involved in this, in this process. So um, this is comparison of HRSVM. Essentially, what, what, we, what I'm showing you is an improvement in micro F1 and macro F1 for these data sets for HRSVM over SVM. So first of all, HRSVM will always outperform SVM. And I'm just showing you the performance improvement. So there's a ratio of the you know, percentage improvement. right? So, so remember, these are large number of classes. Uh, so you, you're not going to see 20%, 30% improvement. Whatever improvement you're going to see is uh, one, to three or three, 1 to 3 or 4%. But then you can drill down and see where you're making those uh, performance improvements. So we see some uh, key changes here. As you can see, the macro F1 improvement is much more, which also goes back to my previous point that these methods help the poor guys, help the guys uh, which help the classes which have fewer training examples because your macro F1 is improving much. They also compare HRLR with LR, and the story is similar where you'll see the hierarchically, re hierarchically uh, regularized logistic regression improves upon its flat baseline, which, which ignores the hierarchy. Okay. Question? So it's a percentage improvement, right? So it's a method x minus the blaze line divided by the baseline. So here is the here is the micro F1 comparison. So these are percentages again, but these are average micro F1, micro F1s, and and you'll see um, uh, you know there is HRSVM, HRLR, and and for larger data sets, there is much more you know you'll see more improvement than even the the Bayesian logistic regression. Because the HR methods enforce that they want to do well, uh, you know, by the MTL setting, they are trying to enforce uh, helping, as I said, the rare classes. So you're seeing a much more, uh, you're seeing some improvement there. Some of these methods are not scalable, and some of these are not applicable, right? So based on uh, what kind of methods it is uh, and what kind of data set it is, some of them are not applicable for multi-label data sets. So that's why we 
that's why they don't report that. So I'm sorry, this looks stretched here a little bit. So this just shows you the slowness factor. So now we wanted to compare, they wanted to compare the, the run, training runtime comparisons uh, between the HR SVM versus SVM. So, so of course, when you do this kind of complicated regularization, you're gonna pay a little bit penalty. Remember, in the flat, you're ignoring the hierarchical structure and just training independent leaf nodes. In this case, you are using the hierarchy in some way and you're doing this optimization that has some expensive steps. So you're, you're seeing that this is, for example, three times slower, uh, HR SVM is three times slower uh, than, than SVM on a smaller data set and about two times slower on the largest data set, just to give you a feel for that. So you have the runtime numbers in minutes, and again, these are training runtimes, these are not prediction runtimes. Uh, so they, these are the training runtime in minutes, and some of them they are scalable. Now in this study, uh, since this was a coordinate descent type optimization or a gradient descent type optimization, the number of iterations was just set to two. Right? So when they reported these numbers in minutes, they were just set to two. Uh, so this is a very short, uh, short number of iterations. When we did the study again, we, we ran it for much larger, larger, larger iterations. Question. So these runtimes are on, are on a, um, so they are on a cluster, but they're aggregated for uh, total number of time taken on all the nodes in that cluster. So, so we're not reporting the parallel runtime here. Yes. Cost was cost. Yeah. Yeah. So, so even though the, it looked there was a double summation there, but it was essentially my node and my number of you know my one parent, but parent and the number of children, right? So. Yeah, so it's not that much. It's like maybe four or five extra uh, iterations there. Okay. Other questions? It is. It is. It is still convex. So it depends on whether you're using LR or SVM. One will be non-smooth, one will be smooth. Right? Uh, logistic regression will be smooth. The SVM will be convex, non-smooth. I, I can't hear you. Oh, but it's not, these are the methods that are, these are different, these are some other methods. Remember, these are the baselines, and these baselines are not scalable. Right. Sorry. Right. Okay. 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 Right. Right. Okay, right. How to make sure those four or five uh, probabilities that they come out to effectively take a call in the production scenarios that whether the someone is a problem or not, or not transition to you. If I just stand alone think and using a percentile chart, I probably will be disrupting you know, five times more than the transition chart is disrupting as well. I think I can increment a lift, but essentially, I don't want to disrupt this general. Yeah, so that's, a, that's more a, what I'll say is a, a next step. Right, so the algorithms are providing you the probabilities. Now the next step is the utility and some decision guidance system that you're building on top of that. Um, so that's not, uh, that's, I, I think it's very application specific. And, uh, right. Right.
Well, I, I think that's a great point. And um, I, I know there are some sessions here, right, on uh, data science and, and the next step or like industrial connections and things like that. I think there are some people are really thinking about these things. Uh, I am a university researcher right now, right? Uh, if the if American Express wants to put some money in my pocket, uh, in my you know research pocket, then then of course we can think about those those challenges and those issues too. But we can talk more later for sure. Okay, thank you. Um, so if you look at so it's about two twenty. So I've been talking for one hour twenty minutes. So let me first take a step back and understand that uh, we are at the same page here. So. Uh, so far, hierarchical classification, we defined that, we talked about the challenges, we talked about some of the, you know, why we care about that. Um, and then we said, here are some, you know, broad strokes of some ideas on how to do that. One of them is, I, I like to call the naive, simple, ignore the hierarchy altogether. And then we talked about this HRLR, HRSVM, that is like a multitask learning approach. Uh, it involves joint training of all these classification models, and it enforces that the parent and the children share some relationships. And that's what that's where we are at right now. And I showed that this HR, uh, HRLR and HRSVM does very well in terms of performance, right? So it helps the poor guys. It helps the classes which are uh, rarer. Uh, it also uh, helps. Uh, it, and, and, and right now we we are focused on the classical definition, which is single labeled, right? And you have to uh, predict the leaf node. Okay, you have to predict the leaf node. I also restricted myself to trees, right? And not DAGs or not graphs because that creates some more challenges. But there are solutions for those for those for those issues. Too. Okay. So any quick questions on and any of those things that we talk about so far? So they do. So this will uh, so this will involve you know our previous. Um, there was a question about the probability. So this will involve if you can come up with some probability measure right now that'll say that I'm hundred percent confident that I cannot go anywhere anywhere beyond this. Right. So they can apply that, but the changes the formulation a little bit for sure. So the um, so in my references there are some work which talk about uh, internal node or orphan node prediction, and and there's some work by that. Uh, will Cohen at Carnegie Mellon has been doing some work on that, so there's some lots of references on his his group. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, I won't be talking about specifically, but you know we. I presented results for that. So these methods cross apply to that. So the, the st standard way is to say to relax the assumption to say that you know if you are doing um, if you are doing multi label, you'll say it's a, it's normally called a soft cut method. You'll say that I want to take three labels instead of one label, and then for those three labels, I'll go through the path and verify whether they belong to those labels. So so remember that. Uh, so let's go back to that's a good question. Let's see. Let's go back to a tree, right? So let's assume that let's assume that one of your labels is this path of the tree, and the other label is let's say this path of the tree. Okay. Now remember that all you're optimizing is at least in this method, you're, all you're optimizing is that this parent and this child are similar. There's nothing to do with this path of the tree right now, right? And the, there might be some optimization going on here, which says that these these two are similar, these two are similar, these two are similar. So now during decision time, you will predict for each of the leaf nodes, correct? And your prediction might work out this way as well as this way. Might be the top two predictions, and you will say that if you know that it's multi-label. That's a classical. They'll say that it's called soft cut. They'll say I have three labels now, and these are the top three that I get. So the methods are they apply to multi-label. There, there could be some more interesting connections to the multi-label learning literature that could be exploited here, but I personally haven't. Done that means other people have done that for sure. Yeah. Can you find some of the so, so taxonomy of products, right? So based on the product information, classify them into the tax category of products, right? That's one way. Uh, 
and the taxonomy of products is then used in recommender systems. Uh, in the rec you know, you use the taxonomy to optimize that. Um, there is some, you know, image images are classified. So images are segmented first. Then you want to classify each of those different segmentations in a hierarchy. Uh, so there's a lot of interesting work there. In this case, we do, in this HRS one, we do look at all the leaves. So it's a, it's a good option. So this is an expensive one. So this is expensive during prediction runtime because I have to look at all the leaves. Remember, this was like this class of global Big Bang type approach, right? And this one, um, so, there, so there is a Hadoop implementation for this, right? So there's a Hadoop, there's a MapReduce implementation for the same thing. Right. No, not necessary. So they, they still do well. So essentially what, what is happening is that if you think about going back to the multitask learning literature, right, what is, what is happening is there were classes that had no chance. Now they're using some more examples from the other classes and hopefully they are learning something that is better, better suited for them. I'm I'm not sure I follow that. You mean like ten different like ensemble of models or? Yeah, I'm saying uh, let's say ten different models instead of building one model for ten classes. But these are uh, like kind of binary classification. Let's say if you build ten binary classification models, right? One uh, multi-class model by sampling. Like how would how would the ten be different? Like are they different methods? Or are they just sampling? Just So, so, so I, I just want to ensure, right, that even if you do multi-class, right, it depends. You could run multi-class as independent binary, or you could learn a formulation which actually, if you look at the optimization function, they're still doing binary one versus rest classification. So, in a way, there's no like difference. Again, this is not the scope. Sorry, this is not the scope of this tutorial. So, I'll, I'll try to not answer beyond that right now. But we can talk about that later, uh, over drinks or something. Other questions? I know there was another last final one. Okay, so I'm going to move ahead because I I know we want to get coffee at three, and and I need coffee at three. So. Uh, Okay, so we talked about all this. Okay, so now we we come back and so this is a this was a this was a fun exercise. Uh, my student Anveshi, uh, he's now a data scientist at uh, G uh, G I O T type things. So so he was you know struggling, and he's like trying to figure out how to you know get the next big big thing, and he essentially uh, came up with this thing that. Let's look at the drawbacks of that HR SVM and HR error. Let's look at what the drawbacks are, right? So scalable, but it's expensive to train than the flat class. It's scalable, right? There's a map reduce solution, um, and, and you can do the independent uh, at, at multiple levels. So it's certainly scalable, but it's still expensive than the flat classification in terms of training time. We also said it requires specialized implementation and communication between the processing nodes. Right, so because of that small dependency, that it still requires some, some, some things, and it may not deal with the class imbalance directly. Right, so you do get class imbalance, nice properties because of MTL, but it does not enforce that. Right, so it does not really enforce that. So our objective was: can we decouple models so that they can be trained in parallel without dependencies between the models? So our objective was: we want to help these researchers who don't have access to Hadoop, who don't want to, have, you know, don't want to, don't, have, don't want to write MPI code. Right? They want to train embarrassingly parallel, uh, parallel uh, programs. And we won't try to account for class imbalance in the optimization framework. So I, I, see, I think that this point is not as important as this other one, where we want to decouple models so that there are no dependencies between the different models. So the way we approach this 
is we went back and looked at the uh, we looked looked at the tree, we thought about this, and, and we came up with this realization. So let's assume this is a hypothetical hierarchy. So this is again one of my slides. If you're colorblind, it doesn't help you, right? But but I'm going to go with this. Okay. Um, so if you notice, there are, there's a root node. There are two um, two children here. Within this gray, uh, there are these other two nodes. One is blue, one is green, and within this guy, within this white number node two, there's another. Um, peach node, uh, and, and it has five. What I'm also doing is I'm showing you some examples, and I'm separated those examples by some characters. So I say that you know these are crosses, these are pluses, and these are hashes, and they kind of you know fan out in the in the hierarchy as they, as, as as you go down the levels. So if you consider one versus rest classification, which is what these models are doing, then the blue node's job is to say, do you belong? Do you, does your example look like these classes with this hash symbol versus somebody who looks like this plus or cross? Okay. Whereas the green node's job is to say, do I belong to the, do I look like the positive or plus examples versus the uh, versus this hash and the cross? And the peach node is whether I belong to the cross versus the positive or the hash. Right. So that's my uh, goal when I train these one versus rest classifiers. Everybody okay with this? I haven't said anything that is new so far. Okay, I go back and I say, hey, this is my loss function, and this is my regularizer. So the regularizer, the regularizer, especially in the HRSVM, is saying that three, the blue node should be similar to the gray node, the, the green node should be similar to the gray node, and hence the green and the blue nodes are similar to each other. Okay, so what it does is regularizer is promoting similarity between the siblings. But the loss function is saying that if I belong to the blue node, I am different from the green node and the peach node. And if I belong to the peach node, I am different from the blue and the green node. And if I am in the, in the green node, I am different from the blue and the peach node. So the right, there's some, something that I need to worry about here. And there is this parameter called lambda, right, which will uh, essentially say which one is more important. So I'll have to tune this based on on the on my training set and then I'll figure out. So there is some some notion here that is that is that is so we we, we thought about this okay these opposing learning influences where the last term the model for a node is forced to be dissimilar to all the other nodes where the regularization term says that the model is forced to be similar to its neighbors and create a similar similarity to neighbors. So what this what happens is that if you get a negative example example that doesn't really belong there that come from near nodes, it's less severe than coming from far nodes while still taking advantage of the hierarchy. Right? So this is the if you if you go analyze the prediction errors, this is what you observe. Okay? So we change this, right? So we change this formulation to say, can we incorporate the hierarchy or this trade-off in another way? Can we not force this trade-off in the in the regularization, but can we take this hierarchy and force it in the in the loss function? So our approach is essentially considered what is called cost sensitive loss. Right? And for each class T, which is separable over examples, you have some loss function already. And your loss function is the hinge loss, classical hinge loss, which is saying, I am different from everybody else. Right? And it's, it's already doing that. But now we take that loss value, and I multiply its importance, I scale it by the importance of the example in my training set that belongs to this class. Right? Which means, if I look at an example that belongs to my sibling, and I make a mistake for that versus somebody who is very, very far away, then the, the, the mistake that I make for my sibling is much more severe than somebody who is very far away. So we take this hierarchy and we, and we push it into the loss function somewhere. So we, 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 we said here's a loss function and there is this term phi now, and this phi is an example of what is called the instance-based uh, loss function, instance-based cost function, and it essentially scales your loss to say that some examples you, you give a higher penalty, but some examples you don't care about. Okay? Now this should also remind you of any sort of imbalance uh, losses that you can incorporate within the classification. Right? So for classes which have fewer examples, if you make a mistake on those, then you should have a higher penalty than classes which have lots and lots of examples. So it's a similar idea, but in this case now we are saying we're going to use the hierarchy uh, to do this. So we thought about this and I said, how do we incorporate hierarchies uh, for this cost, okay? 
And today in this room, I'm confident that each of us could come up with our own version of how to incorporate this. And essentially, that's what happened. We came up with like 30 or 40 different ways of doing this, but then we picked three that made the most sense and were most reasonable. Okay. So the question was, how do we define costs based on hierarchy now? And one of the ways was, which we call tree distance, which is uh, we use the undirected graph distance between the nodes, or we could use the number of common ancestors in common to the target class and the class label. So remember, there's an example, and we're going to make a it's a training example, so we're going to make a prediction for it, right? And it has a target class or the ground class. So now we'll see the difference between that, you know, the prediction at, during the training time and the and the true class. And we also use something called an exponentiated tree distance, which squashes the tree distance into a suitable range using validation. So now there's some fine tuning that is going to happen. But essentially, we want to force this hierarchy within the uh, within the class classification problem. We also use some fancy ways to do imbalance costs. So we only use the same formulation for the cost sensitive learning, but we use the data imbalance can also be addressed. Right? So we know the there is some large skew right, in the number of examples that belong to different classes. So we use some sort of, a, of again, a squashing function um, to, to combine the imbalance cost with the hierarchical cost. I wouldn't worry too much about like, what this cost is, but you could think about any imbalance class cost that you have used before, multiply that with the hierarchical class, and scale that to the classification loss into your optimization. So for comparison, we're going to use the same data sets as used, uh, proposed in that uh, earlier paper. We also compare to the flat baseline. We also compare to these other hierarchical baselines. So I'm pruning some of those other methods which didn't do very well last time, just to get a sense of you know these are more competitive. And also going to use this top-down logistic regression, which is nothing more than a one versus multi one versus s multi-class classifier trained at each level, but it works in a top-down fashion. And we're also going to use this HRLR, which is a recursive regularization approach based on hierarchical. So here are some here are some results on on these different data sets. So there's a cleft data set. These are small, uh, DMOS small IPC RC1, and we perform comparison of the hierarchical costs as well as the micro F1 and macro F1. So you'll see that um, logistic regression is the flat baseline, and TRD and C and XTRD are the different types of hierarchical costs, and the performance varies based on which data set it is. So there's some some you know some cross validation that you need to do here to figure out the right parameters in, at some level, and and essentially any time um, there is this double uh, tick mark versus a single tick mark, this just means that it's statistically significant at a higher level versus a lower level. So I'm not going to spend so so, uh, so so sorry oops. So there is a micro F1, micro macro F1, there's a HF1, and there's a uh, tree error. So tree error is lower is better, whereas all the other ones are higher is better. So we also did this with the imbalance, and we see that whenever you add imbalance, so you multiply the hierarchical cost with the imbalance cost, it gives you an additional boost. So, in, so I'm going to move a little bit ahead here, and now we want to show you the results of the best methods with the other methods. So now we have higher cost, which is our approach, HRLR. Um, LR and TDLR. So we did the same thing with HRSVM. So I'm just showing you the logistic regression results here. Um, and these are some of the data sets that we have, and then and then the performance difference between the higher cost and HRLR. So what is interesting here is that higher cost and HRLR had similar performance, right? So remember, they're both trying to do the same thing. They're doing the hierarchical classification. They're trying to take the hierarchy into account. One is modifying the hierarchical one is modifying the, the regularization function based on the hierarchy. The other one is modifying the loss function based on the hierarchy. Um, but both of these methods are similar in, in what objective they're trying to achieve. So it's good that they are achieving the same results. Um, so what we also wanted to do is compare the runtimes. Uh, so CLEF is a very small data set. So TDLR is, of course, TDLR is the one which trains independent models, but then ignores the hierarchy altogether. It's going to be super fast during runtime, uh, during prediction time too. Um, LR is the flat method, and higher cost is the is the method that that we introduce. So what is good is the higher cost and LR, which is the flat method. Even though higher cost is higher, it is similar. It's, it's actually much better than the HR LR and HR SVM. Uh, but also the key thing is that since each of those models were trained independently, we we could train them in an embarrassingly bad. So there's no like. Uh, 
uh, MapReduce setup. There's no MPI setup here. It's all independent of each other. And, and so that was one of the benefits that we really, really wanted. This software is available out here um, on, on, on our lab web page. And it's implemented in Python. It uses scikit-learn. And it also uses an SVM light. You can also incorporate SVM light loader. So if you wanted to use LR versus SVM, you could incorporate both of these things. And there are some other prerequisite packages that you need to install if you, if you, want to, if you, if you care to use this. What is interesting about um, what I really like about the way we did this is um, there is this option called N, which set of nodes to train for parallelization, right? So essentially, you take, um, let's say you have 100,000 classes, or you have 10,000 classes. So what you do is you say um, dash N 10. So it will automatically do this div division of labor for you, right? So instead of writing scripts for yourself, it does this automatically, and then you can spawn them off on your uh, favorite cluster. It'll go do the results, and it'll come back. Uh, so that's a, that's a good uh, advantage. And as you can see, we incorporate, um, um, uh, we, we, we can save the learn model parameters. We have a way to incorporate the hierarchy path, the, date, the training path. And there's also some variation of cost functions. But you are free to customize these cost functions. So you could come up with your own cost functions. Remember, I'm presenting three of the ones that we thought were most reasonable. But when we uh, were trimming down, we had more than 15 or 20 of them that we initially came. So, it's 2.45, but let me ask you some questions. I'm really not going to uh, do the demo here, uh, but any quick, quick questions before we move on to the next part? That's a good. No, so prediction time for even the higher cost is you're firing all the leaf nodes. So that's very expensive again. So you're going to fire all the leaf nodes. But you can do them, again, in parallel. But that is, it's going to be expensive. So the fastest one is going to be top down right, uh, during prediction time. So that's a good, good uh, thing to think about. Because in the next part, we're going to talk about why to use top down methods. Right? So top down methods will be very good from prediction time. But they suffer because if you make an error at the top, then everything downstream is incorrect. So if you have errors at the top, you're going to propagate those errors. Um, but they're super fast compared to the flat. The flat, the HRLR, and the HRSVM. Sorry, uh, flat, HRLR, and higher cost all have the similar prediction runtime. So I didn't show them, that's why. But later on, I'll show you prediction runtimes too when we go ahead. Right. So we tried that when we participated in this uh, Q&A classification problem. So it was involved, uh, involved like too many, just like it involved millions of classes. And I don't want to be firing millions of classes. So we did this, you know, it's a very common idea. You, you take your examples, you do a quick search, and you say these, doc, these examples are common to these examples. And then you fine tune that by building a classification. So we, now we are not really training and testing on millions of examples. We're training and testing only on 20 or 30 examples, 30, 20 or 30 classes. So that's a, it's a common strategy. Oh, that's a good, that's a good, we didn't, cons I think we did consider that we didn't get, we, we were losing some performance. So we tried that, actually we tried that, but we were losing some performance, we we're losing some accuracy here. So is there a way to learn the hierarchy? Now, that's a pretty interesting question. So one you know, easiest way is to do a clustering, right? But then do you trust the clustering? Um, then there are multitask learning algorithms that try to learn task relationships uh, in, the, in the optimization. So you could try that. Um, I think it's just too complex. It's a, it's a, you know, when you have like 100,000 leaf nodes or 10,000 leaf nodes even, trying to learn the entire hierarchy in a nice way is, is harder. I think a better is you do clustering and you refine that. So you, you do some clustering, and hopefully you can refine that in the process of, of your classification. But that's a good research topic. Like nobody is, I think nobody has really uh, hammered that out here. The questions. So I, I'm going to leave this next 15 minutes to ask questions. And if you don't have any, we can wait for the coffee break and be back by 3.15 or so. Uh, 